So I really like to travel. Like I, I enjoy it a lot, and I know there are some people who, uh, who really are not fans of travel, that they are you know, really much more comfortable um, at home, just sort of in their own beds, in their own sort of uh, you know, uh, zones, their own sort of worlds. Hey, can, would you mind turning some lights on for us, Scott? Um, but I, I really enjoy it, and I think maybe the reason that some people don't like it is that with travel, with, in journeys, there are risks. There are things that uh, can or might go wrong when we travel. You know, that, that happens, and I think maybe that's one of the things that I like about travel is that there are situations that come up and and there are disturbances and it's it's an adventure. Now one of the uh, one of my favorite uh, lines in The Hobbit is the wizard Gandalf talks to uh, Bilbo Baggins, the little Hobbit, and he says um, that he talks about the world where he grew up, the land where he grew up. He says, you know, but your home is behind you. The world is ahead, right? The, your home is behind you. The world is ahead. And that, to me, for some of you, you're like, that sounds terrifying. And for some of you, you're like, that sounds awesome. I can't wait. Let's go. I, to, this morning, I want to talk about a, a, tra- a journey, a trip that some friends took. Um, it was five friends. They, they went on a, on a trip together. And um, they're... They sort of started off the trip with a destination in mind. Like they knew where they were going to go. They knew where they were, what they were going to see. They knew the town where they were going. They, you know, had a pretty clear picture. You know, I don't know that they necessarily had like a an itinerary. You know, I don't think they had gone to like you know a travel agent to kind of give them a minute by minute of everywhere they were going and the things they were going to see and stops along the way. But but their trip was not exactly what they planned. It didn't go the way that they planned, um, but it turned out pretty great anyway. The, f- the five young men that, that made this trip, four of them were friends with this fifth young man. This fifth young man was, was paralyzed, and he had been paralyzed for some time. We're, um, he had been paralyzed for some time, and his friends knew that if they could get him to Jesus, that Jesus would heal him. Right. They, they had seen that Jesus had performed these healings. There, you know, it was, it was sort of word spreading about Jesus all around that part of Israel and in, in Galilee. And so, you know, they just knew if, if we can get him to Jesus, that it'll be great. And so they, they go to the city named Capernaum. And you can read about this in Mark, Luke, and Matthew. All three of them have it together. And, and as they, they go to the city of Capernaum, they go to the place where Jesus is, which at this point in Jesus' ministry, wherever Jesus went, there was a crowd. Right, there was a crowd everywhere that Jesus went. People would look for him, and they would follow him. And so, you know, it's not that they had to, you know, have a lot of knowledge exactly, you know, where Jesus was going to be. They just kind of showed up at the town and asked for directions, which is, I know in, like, 2021 is really a lost art. But, like, there was a time when you would go to a town, and you would go to a gas station, and you'd ask for directions. Like, I'm just... You might try this. This week, go into a gas station and ask the attendant for directions and just see how they respond. I imagine they'd be like, for what directions? Like, you know, I don't even know if gas stations still sell maps. But anyway, like you would go and you'd ask. So you, I imagine, and this isn't explicit in Scripture, but I imagine they go to the city of Capernaum and they're, they're looking for Jesus. And so they went to the gas station station, whatever, um, the, the donkey refill station or whatever, and, and they say, where is, where's Jesus? And they say, oh, well, I heard he's over here. And so they go, and they're, they're carrying their friend. And we don't know exactly how many miles they went, but we know that everywhere they went, they were carrying him on a mat. And you can kind of picture a, a small sort of bed sheet with loops at the corners that they've grabbed him up, and they're, they're carrying him. And they're carrying him to this place where they, they think that Jesus is going to be. And when they get there, there is a crowd. And we can imagine that they're like, okay, well, let's make sure that 
that this is Jesus that's in there, that this isn't just, you know, like some sort of like an Amway convention or something. Like, let's make sure that Jesus is. So you can imagine that one of them kind of goes in, sees, hears somebody teaching. He's like, yep, that's, that's definitely Jesus. And so, the, but it, it's crowded. It's, you know, a home, and there are people just everywhere there's just like this crush of humanity in this place and there's no way that five of them are going to make it through to jesus definitely not for carrying the fifth it's just not going to work and so you know there we've obviously got some some gt like real creative young men here um, or maybe just run-of-the-mill young men who are looking for a way to get in trouble and so they say ha i know what we'll do Let's go up on the roof. Because if these guys are like my kids, they're always just looking for an excuse to go on the roof. Right? They're like, like the fire alarm. I could be cooking. The fire alarm goes off. The, or the smoke detector goes off. And they're like, house is on fire. Let's go on the roof and jump off. Like, it takes nothing for them to want to go on the roof. So these guys are like, hey, let's go on the roof. And there are some scholars who think that maybe there were outside stairs. Or perhaps there was a ladder. I don't know that either of those things are true and i think maybe if there weren't ladders or a stairs that these young men probably found that as a special challenge and maybe looked forward to it even more like hmm how are we going to get this body up there can we toss him do you mind being tossed right <laughs> it's like not it's not like we're going to paralyze you anyway um so like they somehow whether it's climbing a ladder climbing stairs in some way maybe rigging up a, a catapult they get him to the roof and most roofs in that time in that part of the world were clay roofs, so they would have taken sticks, they would have taken you know, pieces of wood, and they would have made sort of a grid work across the roof, and then they would have laid clay on and let the clay bake in the sunshine until it was hardened. And these young men, they get there, and they're on top of this roof, and it's hardened clay, and they say, okay, now we're on the roof, so what do we do now? Let's dig. And so they start digging through this roof. Now, they probably didn't bring sh tools. Like probably none of them are holding a shovel or a pickaxe. They're probably just grabbing things that they find, maybe getting you know rocks or or other clay bricks and breaking clay against clay. Or ma they literally maybe just you know scratching with their fingernails. We have no idea exactly how, but they start making their way to make a hole in the roof. Now here's the point at which like I try to imagine what it must have been like inside right where jesus is sitting there teaching right and so he's sitting there and he's like you know blessed are the meek boom 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 and i have to imagine that there was somebody who early on caught on that there's something going on on the roof because there's always somebody who has better hearing than other people and so somebody's like hey, hey i think i think i hear something on the roof and somebody's like shh jesus is talking it's probably just a bird and then the noise becomes a little more obvious. And it's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's something happening on the roof. Shh, it's probably a squirrel or something, right? It's probably a squirrel or something. Just listen to Jesus. And I imagine, like, as they start breaking through the roof, you know, did Jesus start talking louder? He's like, just ignore that noise coming from the roof. There's definitely something on the roof. I told you there was something. On Shh, Jesus is yelling. Right? And, and so as the noise gets louder and louder and then debris starts falling from the roof, you know, does Jesus, like, is Jesus just so patient in his teaching that he's just going to teach right through it? Or does he just start laughing and say, you know what, guys, let's just, let's just give this a minute and kind of see what happens, you know? I imagine he probably persisted for some time with what he was saying, maybe finished the particular parable that he was teaching at that point. And then he says, okay, let's see. And then a hole opens, very small at first, and then the, the aperture opens wider and wider and wider, and this sunlight is, is coming through. And then they see a young man's head look in and be like, yep, that's Jesus. Here we go. And then they lower their friend down on his mat in faith that somebody down there is going to accept him and help them lower him the rest of the way and then he's lowered there and he's in front of jesus and this is where matthew picks up the story and matthew he picks up the story in verse two he says 
It says, Behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Like, I love the fact that Jesus doesn't see this person's status. He doesn't look and immediately see this person's disability. For Jesus, the defining characteristic of what is happening right here, right now, is not this person's infirmity. It is these people's faith. He looks past his infirmity, past the situation here, and he sees in these four young men, he sees faith. And based on the faith that they have shown, him entrusting in Jesus to heal him, them entrusting that Jesus can heal him, and the lengths that they're willing to go to for their friend to be healed, he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, at this point, I wonder what the men up top are thinking. Right? Are they they're looking on with interest? And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And they kind of look at each other and say, wait, did did he just say his sins are forgiven? He knows that we brought him here to be healed, right? Like you, did you did y'all like maybe pen a note to him or something? You know, why why is he down there forgiving sins when we've brought him here for this? Jesus is doing this on purpose. He's he's making a point. He's making a point that is let's be clear. The point that he makes is made so vivid in what he's about to do. We don't even know what he was teaching before this. It's like everything that Jesus was teaching before this does not convey the message of the gospel better than this, what's happening right here with this paralyzed man. This is what Matthew wants to include, not the teaching, but what Jesus shows them today. He says, your sins are forgiven. Now, one of the things that we don't really carry in our culture explicitly, like we don't say this out loud, but sometimes... It kind of exists maybe in our minds and our hearts a little bit. And what we do is we say, well, because this person's in a bad situation, they must have done something to deserve it, right? Like, and sometimes, like, it makes sense. Like, we'll see that somebody's in a financial crisis, and we'll be like, yeah, well, they probably shouldn't have bought that Maserati or whatever. You know, they probably shouldn't have bought that fancy house or clothes or, or whatever, and we justify that. We kind of, you yeah. know. Sometimes we'll even do that with, with sickness well oh they have that disease well that disease is probably because of something they did i love this like somebody will get lung cancer and will be like they have lung cancer they didn't even smoke right they didn't even smoke what are we doing there we're connecting their infirmity with their behavior we do that like we're still we still do that even though like science has shown us that sometimes cancer is just genetic Sometimes it's environmental, sometimes it's behavioral, but it's all kinds of, but still, we, we look there, we see there's some connection here. For them, it was much more explicit. For them, they had rabbis who were teaching that if someone is born with their body broken, that their parents must have sinned. That their parents have displeased God, and that is why this thing has happened to them. This, this was taught all over the place. And Jesus... He, though, he, he's kind of capitalizing on that misconception. He's capitalizing on that misconception, and he's really kind of, you know, rubbing their noses in their misunderstanding here because it's obvious to everyone why this young man has been brought here. It's obvious to everyone why these friends have gone to such great lengths to bring their friend before Jesus. They're there for a physical healing and Jesus speaks first of the spiritual. He speaks first of the spiritual. It's as if he's saying, I'm going to forgive his sins. And if I forgive his sins, then he'll be healed. Right? His body's broken because he did something. Right? And so if I forgive his sins, then it's all good and he'll immediately be healed. Right? But that's not the case. Jesus is pointing out to him, saying, listen, you guys are teaching that when somebody's body is, is messed up, that it's because they've sinned or their parents have sinned or something. You're missing the point. That's not why this has happened. So he says, I'm going to forgive your sins. Your sins are forgiven. And then 
And then some of the scribes, in verse 3, behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming, right? This man is blaspheming to say that the, his sins are forgiven. Here's, blasphemy is to essentially say something that is false about God or, or to exalt someone else to the level of God would be blasphemy. And so they're saying this guy is elevating himself to be on the same level as God. He's claiming to be able to do something that only God can do. And the answer here is, is pretty easy. Um, Some time ago I heard a story. A man was asked by his children, who has more money, you or mom? And his kids were trying to figure this out. His kids were trying to figure it out. So who do you think has more money, dad or mom? And they had been wrestling with this for some time in the back seat of, of his SUV. You know, who has more money, you or dad or mom? And here were some of their points. It seems like dad's job is more important. So it seems like he probably makes more money than mom does. The counterpoint to this argument was astute. But mom drives a much nicer car counterpoint but mom's car is always so much dirtier than dad's counterpoint because we're always getting it dirty right and they back and forth trying to and the dad eventually interjects and he says hey guys mom and i have the same amount of money because we share all of our money and and mom's car even though she drives it more that's also my car and my car is her car. Everything that we have, we have in common. So we have the same bank account. So if she writes a check or I write a check, it's coming from the same place. Jesus says he forgives sins because he and God share the same bank account. Right? It's, it's coming from the same place. It's not that, that God has this reservoir of forgiveness and grace and mercy and that Jesus has a separate lower it's it's all coming from the same place and the the pharisees the scribes they rejected this notion out of hand because they couldn't believe that jesus was in fact god and so him claiming to forgive these sins let's not mistake this this isn't jesus saying that he has something separate from god it is that jesus is claiming to be god he's claiming to be god and if in a different context, in a different setting, when Jesus made statements like this, these same scribes who were wondering these things in their head, these same scribes would be saying these things out loud. And in one particular setting, they would not only say these things out loud, they would say these things out loud, they would agree with each other, and then they would go and pick up rocks to throw at Jesus. Right? They, they took blasphemy very seriously. And Jesus, in their minds, is committing blasphemy. But he's not. Because Jesus, verse 4, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Why do you think evil in your hearts? What he's saying here is that he's saying you see something, but you're interpreting it the wrong way. You see one thing, but you're labeling it something else. You should see forgiveness but you're labeling it blasphemy we see this this sort of slanted perspective a lot in our culture right like we see journalists sorry i forgot my quotes journalists um write things about people and we see very clearly that there is a bias imagine you know the first week of april april the uh, orange leader writing a story local church group gets together for mass littering event and they would report it they would say a local church group got out and on their public or on their private wooded property spread debris and litter everywhere and you having been at the event would say hold on. that was an easter egg hunt And the journalist would say, it was litter. They were Easter eggs. They were just little plastic eggs. They're, they're bad for the environment. They 
were filled with candy. And the journalist says, tooth decay is a real problem, sir. Right? It, it's almost like it doesn't matter what you say or what you do. When someone's perspective is that they have evil in their heart, they will never see it any other way. They're never going to see it any other way. And so these men, they see Jesus has forgiven this man of his sins. And they say, blasphemy, blasphemy. Because there is something that is objectively, just absolutely objectively good. And in their twisted perspective, they're going to still see it as evil. Because the evil is in their hearts. So they can't see it any other way. So Jesus takes them a step farther. He takes them a little bit farther because if they can't accept that forgiveness is objectively good, then let's do what is clearly objectively good and understood to be good everywhere. And he's going to give healing. But before he does that, he asks this in verse 5. He says, for which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? Now, this is a riddle. Like there isn't. Jesus doesn't ask this because there's a clear answer. Because the answer that you come up with about which is easier to say is going to say about what your perspective of Jesus is. Right? Like, if, if you think that this man is a charlatan, that he's some sort of con artist, then it's much easier to say, your sins are forgiven. Because no one can prove that they aren't. Like, there's no one present there who could authoritatively speak for God and say, uh, no, actually, he, he just said the sins are forgiven, but I just talked to my sources in heaven, and they're not. Right? If he was a charlatan, then that's a lot easier to say. But if he is the son of God, it's a lot easier to say, rise and walk. It's a lot easier to say, rise and walk. It's a lot easier track with me here for just a minute it's a lot easier if he is the son of god it's easier for jesus to heal this man's paralysis than to forgive his sins why because the cost of healing his paralysis is the words to say rise and walk the cost of forgiving his sins was the cross so you answer that question which is easier to say based on your perspective if you see that he is the son of god then it's easier for him to heal a body if he's a charlatan it's easier for him to say your sins are forgiven And so he says, which is easier to say. He says, but let's make it clear. But so that you may know, in verse 6, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Rise, get up, go home. He says, I do this so that you may know this physical healing isn't just for the sake of the friends. Because of the friend's faith, because of the faith of this paralytic, he has already given him the most valuable thing, forgiveness of sins. He says, I've already given you a more valuable thing, but I'll give you a less valuable thing for the sake of these critics here. Rise and walk. Rise and walk. It's a weird thing to have to prove who you are. It's a weird thing to have to prove who you are. We have to do that a lot today. You talk to somebody on customer service on the phone, and they'll they'll be like, you know, they'll. What really struck me as odd. Sometimes I, my credit card company, if there's some sort of weird charge or something, they'll call me. Right? This, we had this happen. Some of you. They'll call me and say, "It seems that there's been some strange activity on your credit card. Are you?" Dylan Anthony. Yes. Do you live at? And they'll give my address, and then they'll say, "Is your social security?" I'm like. You called me, right? You call, why do I need to prove who, uh, who I am? You called me. I answered my phone. Why do I need to prove it? And we would think that with all that Jesus had done to this point, he should be past the point of having to prove it. It should be that, that, you, that the people there are like, why do I have to prove that I'm the son of God? You came here to listen to me. Except... He knows that they came to listen to him not because they believed, but because they were looking for justifications for their doubts. They were looking at every word he said, and they were trying to hold it up, trying to hold it up and inspect it and find something wrong with it. And he knew that they weren't going to be able to find anything wrong with what he is about to do, what he's doing for this paralyzed man. And then in verse 7, 
and he rose and went home. I imagine that those young men who carried him there and dug a hole through the roof, they were glad that their friend was forgiven. They were glad that their friend was healed. And I imagine that on the way home, they made a joke. Man, I'm glad he healed you because I was tired of carrying you. I'm glad that you're walking home. Because if he hadn't healed you, we were just going to leave you there. <laughs> Guys can be cruel. He rose and he walked home. Verse 8 says, when the crowd saw it, they were afraid. And they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. And it's important here that they were afraid, comma, and they glorified God. For us, it's a question, who was afraid? Who glorified God? My, my feeling is that they weren't all afraid. But I think those scribes were afraid. I think those scribes who were saying, Whoo, blasphemer. And when they saw his power to heal, they knew his power to forgive sins. That based on his power to forgive sins, they knew his authority to condemn sins. And they knew that they had committed blasphemy. And they saw what he did, and they were afraid. And those friends and those followers of Jesus, they saw what Jesus did, and they glorified God. There are multiple perspectives that we can see in a story like this. This morning, I'd like for you to consider really three of them. I'd like for us to consider what three different people in this story did and what it might teach us about how it is that God expects us to live our lives. And the first is the perspective of the friends. The perspective of the friends. The, these, these people who gathered together with the express purpose to bring their friend to Jesus. How amazing. How wonderful. And we think about the lengths. When we think about the lengths that they went to. It ought to inspire us. The way Matthew tells the story, we don't hear about the journey. In fact, even Mark and Luke, when they describe their entry into the house, they don't give a really full account of it. Because the central idea is that Jesus is the power to forgive sins and to bring healing, and that he proved it here. But it's also important for us to understand that those friends carried this man to Jesus. Some of you, I know, are carrying your friends to Jesus. I know that you are. Some of you are carrying your children to Jesus, that you are doing everything in your power to bring them to Jesus, sometimes kicking and screaming along the way. But you want them to have a chance to be face-to-face -face with a heavenly Father that loves them so much more than an earthly father even can. That you want them to have an encounter with a heavenly Father, with, with Jesus, who would look on them who would look on them and not see how broken they are, but would see their faith. Wouldn't look at them and say, ah, well, you are in this state. You're in this broken state. You're in this spot of, of disrepair. Who wouldn't look at them and say, I see your heartbreak. I see your sin. I see your wrongness. I see your history. But would look past that and would say, I see your faith. And because I see your faith, I can forgive. I'll forgive you. Some of us are carrying friends that way. My encouragement to you is that uh, keep going. Just because it seems like the room is full and there's no room near Jesus, climb a roof, dig a hole. Do what's necessary to take your friends, your family to the feet of their Savior. Don't give up. Don't quit. They may have rejected Jesus once. That doesn't mean they will a second time or a third time. Persist. Keep going. Because your faith can have an amazing impact on someone else's life. Some of us need to see in this, in this story this morning the perspective of the friends. Some of us need to see the story of the paralytic. 
Some of us need to see the story of the paralytic. Imagine how this story might have just turned on a dime if Jesus had said, rise and walk, and the paralytic would be like, nah, man, I'm good. I appreciate it, but I'll take the forgiveness of sins, but as far as walking goes, it's a lot easier for me to let my friends carry me. Because it is. This whole walking thing, it's miles back to my house. I think I'll just chill on this bed. Some of us have been healed by the Lord. Some of us have had our sins forgiven. Some of us have been blessed richly by him. And he's saying, get up and walk. And some of us are resisting. Some of us would rather sit and be forgiven and weak than powerful. Let's make no mistake about it. This paralyzed man carried a testimony forward for the rest of his life to everyone that he saw. Because everybody in his community who saw him lying out in public begging, the next day they saw him looking for a job. They saw him looking for a job. They saw him getting work. They saw him being a productive member of society, not someone who is simply laying about asking for charity, but now he is productive. Now he has a story to tell about how God has changed his life. Some of y'all, God's changed your life and you're keeping it a secret. You're just keeping it a secret. Don't do that. If God has changed your life, tell people about it. Rise up and walk. Don't lay around anymore. Get out there and let people know the difference that God is, has made and is making in your life. That is his calling for you today. That is his calling for you every day. Rise up and walk. Tomorrow morning when you get up out of bed, before your feet even hit the floor, say, today I've got a testimony to take to somebody. Recognize that tomorrow is a testimony. Tomorrow is a chance for you to bear witness about what God has done in your life. Do it. Get out there. Tell somebody about it. We should have a lot of gospel conversations in our lives because the gospel ought to have been shown to be powerful in our lives. I think the third thing that we see, the third perspective we see is that of Jesus' perspective. Because Jesus does an amazingly difficult thing, an, an impo almost impossibly difficult thing. He does it with ease and with grace. And it is something that you and I can do too. You and I, we, we can't heal paralyzed people, but we can forgive. And sometimes it may feel like it'd be easier to heal someone who's paralyzed than to forgive someone who's hurt us. Sometimes that feels a lot easier. Sometimes it feels like forgiveness is impossible. But it's not. Forgiveness is, is impossible if you carry around the wrong perspective. But it's, it is possible if you carry around the right perspective. So the question for us is, how do we get to a point where we forgive. The question is not, can we forgive? Yes, we can. We may feel like we can't, but we can. The question isn't, should we forgive? Yes, we should. We know that. The question for us is, how do we forgive? And the, the how is, is this. We have to put our hearts in the right place. We have to take the evil that's in our hearts towards the things that we see and the people that we encounter. We have to take that evil out and we have to replace it with something else. We have to replace it with God's grace. We have to replace it with goodness. We have to change our perspective. I'm, I'm going to encourage you to, to try something this week. And I think that if you, if you try this, and it's a, it's a prayer technique that has been used for thousands of years since the time of St. Ignatius. It has been used for thousands of years. It's called examine. And it is essentially three prayers to take some time each day to pray three prayers and... Um, and to see how they impact your heart. The first prayer is to ask God to bring to you awareness of the moment today for which you are most grateful. Every day, at the end of the day, sit and pray and say, God, show me the part of my day that I'm most grateful for. And sometimes you'll be surprised at the part of your day that, you, that God shows you that you're most grateful for. Because it, it may not be what you're expecting. 
It may be you thought you sit down and you're like, well, I think I'm most grateful for that meal that was cooked tonight. And then you sit down and you pray and you say, oh, no, I'm not. I'm most grateful for the people that I shared that meal with. That that company is what made that meal, that meal taste great. Or the hands that prepared that meal. That's what I'm truly grateful for. God can open our eyes to, to gratitude. And sometimes we think that we are grateful and when we pray to ask God to show us where we ought to be grateful, he changes our perspective. He changes our, our attitude. He changes our mindset to what we are truly grateful for. The second prayer is to ask God to bring to you awareness of the moment for which you are least grateful. For which you are least grateful. What is the thing that happened today that, that really hurt you or that really bothered you? Was there something that happened today that made it to where you, like, you couldn't feel love towards somebody? Was there something that happened today that made it to where you couldn't feel love from someone? Ask yourself what was said and done in that moment that made things so difficult. Try to walk through that moment to relive the feelings of what you were experiencing and then track it down to find out why you felt that way. Why you felt that way. And, and I, I've, I do this, and sometimes it is, it is alarming, the things that you find that are going on in your heart. The other day, one of my children said something to me. They said, that's wrong. Talking, I said, let's do X, Y, and Z. Said, no, that's wrong. That'll never work. And like 30 minutes later, I was like, hey, well, Haley was like, why are you in a bad mood? I don't know. I'm not in a bad mood. Why do you say I'm in a bad mood? You're not in a bad mood. Fine. And as I'm praying, I'm praying through it, and I'm asking God, why? God, can you tell me why I'm in a bad mood? <laughs> um, I was like, I went back to that moment. I went back to that encounter, and I, I listened, went through it in my head. What, what was said? What was it that like, what, they said you're wrong? Okay, but why is that such an issue? And the Lord says, it's because of your pride. You, you might be right, you might be wrong, but just hearing that, for some reason, it struck a nerve inside of you. And God revealed that to me. Take some time. What is the moment for which you are least grateful? What is the moment that was most challenging for you in that day? And the third thing, is, third thing is to give thanks for whatever it is that you experienced that day. Because after you've taken the time to think about that moment for which you are most grateful, the moment for which you are least grateful, you thank God for both of them. And if we're truly doing steps one and two, and we're really seeking out our natural gratitude, we're really seeking out those moments of ingratitude, we can thank God for those moments of ingratitude because they are refining us. Because those moments of ingratitude are teaching us. They are transforming us to be more in the likeness of Jesus than we were before. And so we are grateful to God for giving us that opportunity. We are thankful even for moments of pain. Because we are putting that pain into the hands of a heavenly father who heals. Forgiveness is possible. Forgiveness is possible, but it is, it's a practice. It's a practice. Jesus forga forgave this man his sins, and it seems like that was an event. It seems like that was just something that just happened, but it wasn't something that just happened. For him, it was something that receiving the forgiveness, for him, it was something that just happened. But for Jesus to give forgiveness was a practice. Jesus was accustomed to to giving forgiveness. Jesus' heart was in a place that he could give forgiveness because he practiced it. You and I have to recognize that forgiveness is a practice. And if we, if we do, if we do it again and again, if we're constantly looking at gratitude and ingratitude and being changed by it, then we'll get better and better at giving forgiveness. There's a, a book series called Outlander 
Some of you read it and, or watch the, the, the series, and it is famous for some steamy interactions in, in a married couple. But I think the part that sticks out to me, there's this beautiful moment of prose in one of the books where a character named Jamie, who's uh, one of the main protagonists in the series, Jamie talks about forgiving this man who has hurt him. He talks about forgiving a man who had sexually assaulted him and the process of forgiveness. And the way Diana Galbadon puts it is, is beautiful. She says that this is what the character says. He says, I waited in emptiness in faith, and then grace came, a necessary vision. And the character felt once more the gift of pity, calm in its descent as the landing of a dove. Frazier recognized he had been a man. This man who harm, harmed him had been a man and nothing more. And in recognition of that common human frailty, all the power of past fear and pain vanished like smoke. You and I, if we're going to be people that can carry the power of the gospel, we can't carry that with unforgiveness. We can't make the gospel known and the gospel powerful while we are carrying a list of grievances against our brothers. We can't say, Jesus is Lord of my life. He has forgiven me of all of my sins. And I have forgiven the people that I really like of theirs. I've forgiven every one of their offenses against me, except for this one person. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel is, I have been forgiven, and I have been so transformed by the forgiveness of God and the power of his grace that I can't help but to want to forgive people. I talked about I've mentioned that forgiveness is a practice. I've given you a way to pray so that it can change your heart to be able to forgive. I want you to understand something else, and that is that not only is forgiveness a practice, unforgiveness is a practice too. That if you and I sit back and we pray prayers where we only ask God to bless meals, where we only ask God to bless me, we only ask God to bless our checkbook. And we're not praying prayers asking him to show us gratitude and ingratitude and help us to have gratitude in all that he sends to us. If we're not praying that sort of prayer, then we are practicing unforgiveness. We are choosing deliberately to not forgive. We are choosing to sit on our mats and continue to live as if we are paralyzed. And if we do that, we will have a gospel that is shackled. We, ha we will have a gospel in our lives that is chained, that is bound, that is constrained by our own unwillingness to do what Christ has called us to do and forgive. I started this morning by saying that when you take a journey, it takes you to some unexpected places, that there are always risks, there are things that happen, and I get it. That forgiveness, that the practice of forgiveness, it may take you some places that aren't comfortable. It may take you to do some things that you don't right now want to do. But, but those twists and turns are worth it. Where forgiveness takes you will always be worth it. Because ultimately the one who directs our path, who lays the course of our steps is faithful and true. And we can trust that if he has commanded us to forgive, that we can take that journey and that it'll take us to a good place. This morning, my encouragement for you is, is simple. Maybe, maybe you need to hear to continue to carry your friends and family to the Lord. And if that is what speaks to you this morning, then I hope that in this time of invitation, you will pray and you will ask God, to give you the strength that you need to continue bringing people to him. 
It may be that you need the message to get up and walk. And that if you take an honest, hard look at your faith journey, you'd say, I'm laying around. I'm letting other people carry me. I'm letting my, I'm letting my wife carry the spiritual walk of our family. I'm, I, I'm letting my history in the church be a guiding force, but I'm not really doing much. I'm not really doing anything about it. Maybe, maybe the message for you is rise up and walk. Maybe the message for you this morning, though, is forgive. That as you've been forgiven, so too forgive. I hope that you will use this time of invitation. Have a dialogue with the Lord. That he will reveal to you where it is that you are this morning. And that he will move you in the direction that you need to go. Let's pray together. Most gracious Father, we thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to be here together to worship you and to be impacted by your word lord there's some here that that need to persist in carrying their friends and family before you i pray that your spirit would be one of encouragement that they would be inspired to continue that when they encounter a a full building that they would carry them to the roof when they encounter clay that they would get to digging they would not be turned back in carrying their friends to you. Lord, I pray that, that we would all reject the, the bed and would instead choose to walk with you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people that can forgive. Lord, we know that forgiveness is more powerful even than healing. And we know what, what price that forgiveness was, was purchased. So, Lord, we pray that you would be help, help us to be people who are known for our forgiveness. Lord, if there's any here who doesn't know you and, and needs to experience that forgiveness today, I pray that your, your spirit would move in a, an undefiable way, that your spirit would move powerfully, and that they would begin a, a conversation, begin a journey that today you could tell them, rise up and walk. We pray these things in Jesus' name.